Okay, third thing today, suspects, prospects, and customers. Let's think about this for two seconds. Let's stick with the idea of the stationary firm. We sell stationery in here, yeah. Virtually every single business in the northeast of England will use stationery in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, whether it's just a couple of pens or whether it's actually you know, an absolutely huge requirement, there will be virtually every single business customer will need stationery. So I would say virtually every single business customer is a suspect of ours. They might buy some stuff from us, they might not. If we have a conversation and understand their requirements, who supplies them at the minute, what it is they do, what works well for them and what we could do for them, we might move them from being a suspect to what I would call being a prospect. Now some customers, and this is a kind of a difficult pill to swallow at times, will never buy from you. You might go and you might have a better price, a better offering, better service, better delivery, better payment terms than a competitor. But if that competitor happens to be your potential customer's brother-in-law and they go out and play golf every Friday, you aren't going to get around that bit. So just accept some things you won't get round. So every customer in this scenario is a suspect. Once we've talked to them, once we've established what it is they need and what we can deliver for them, we might move them to be a prospect. So hence the reason, and it doesn't come out very well on the slide, but hopefully you can make sense of that, it's a funnel. You start with many, many suspects, you kind of distill that down, you funnel it down to a, a fewer number of prospects. They're customers you can go off to and potentially sell to. So let me talk you through how this works in three stages. You have suspects. Suspects might want your product or service, you don't know much about them. You have a conversation, you move them from being a suspect, you find a bit about them, and they become a prospect for you. I think we do an awful lot of work up here, so I'm just going to take a little bit of a break if that's okay. I'm going to ask you a question. You've got four choices here, and you can only raise your hands and vote once. And I'd like you to tell me when you think somebody becomes a customer. So I'm going to give you four scenarios, and you've only got one vote. I'd like you to raise your hand and vote when you think somebody becomes a customer. If I meet somebody at a networking event and have a fantastic conversation with them, if you think at that point they're a customer, could you raise your hand for me? Yeah, well, Susie, fair of you. I like that. If you follow that up and you have a meeting face-to-face -face with that customer and you send them a proposal at that point, are they a customer? Raise your hand if you think they are. One here, any more? Okay. If you take that one stage further and you deliver your product or service, whatever it might be, are they a customer at that point? If you think, can you put your hand up? Two or three more? Yeah? Yeah? About a quarter of the room think that? And last one, if you've delivered your product or service and they have paid your bill, at that point, are they a customer? Thank you very much, you're all with me on that. It's amazing how many people say, I've got loads of customers, great got no invoices, I'm earning no money, but I've got loads of customers. Actually, you don't. You have lots of good social networking. You have lots of good prospects. You don't necessarily have customers paying bills. And surprisingly, and my accountant tells me this, you need people to pay your bills. It's a little tip. So you're probably sat there thinking, well, that's lovely, but how does that relate to me? What, wh why should any of this be important to me? These suspects, prospects, and customers. Why is that important to me? Well, actually, what you need to think about is how much time you spend working in each of these areas. How much time do you spend working on suspects versus how, how much time do you spend working on your prospects or your existing customers? That's half of it. If you understand how much time and effort you put in there, you also need to understand what you get out of that. And a simple expression to remember here, what gets measured gets done. If you really understand what work you're doing and what return you're getting, you can then adjust the work that you do, adjust your activity, adjust your focus to make sure you get maximum return for what you do. So that's top tip number three. Make sure you maximise the time that you spend in the most effective place, be it with suspects, prospects or customers. Okay, top tip number four, ladies and gentlemen. This is my personal favourite. I'm a little bit sad, I know, but this is my job, so bear with me. I do a lot of sessions like this and I work with lots of different organisations. 
And the question I quite often ask is, what percentage of consumers or businesses buy purely on price? I say, I'm a little bit sad. I have a whiteboard in the office and I'm starting to keep a tally on this. And I kind of had, because I was doing this session today, I kind of had a flick back through some notes, check the tally I've got in the office. And the general sort of feedback I tend to get is somewhere between 35 to 40%. So the firms that I work with, people that I deal with, the general impression I get back is 35 to 40% of businesses or consumers buy purely on price. Now you could be sat there thinking, jumping there thinking, that's, that's actually quite low really, because where I work, everybody buys on price. Equally, you might be sat there thinking, well, that could be a bit high level. I think it's a little bit lower than that. I think this area is really interesting. I'll tell you why. I think less than 5% of consumers or businesses buy purely on price. I honestly do. I think it could even be lower than that. And let me explain why. A couple of nice little examples here. Firstly, what a fantastic car that is. Skoda Octavia. I used to have a Skoda. I absolutely loved it. A really, really good value four-door hatchback car. Get you from A to B. You can have lots of different toys put on, you can have aircon, you can have sat nav, whatever you want. It's a really, really good car. I, I believe, and I'm not sure, but somebody said it this morning actually, I think Skoda have won an award recently for the quality of their products. Yeah. So is that a really good product? Audi A4. Does the same sort of job, gets you from A to B. You can have some pretty toys put on that as well. But it does the same job as that. Yet the Audi costs an awful lot more money. And, to boot, the Audi and the Skoda, the manufacturing firms, are owned by the same overall group. So quite often, the engines, the gearboxes, the body panels, some of the switches, some of the interior trim, is the same. Yet that one costs a lot less than that. So you'd think in a world where we're driven by price, you'd see an awful lot more Skodas out there than you would Audis. And coming through the car park today, and I noticed the, um, it's quite interesting when you get the, um, the Tannoy announcements about moving cars, please. It's never, can the owner of the Skoda please move it? Is it? It's always, can the owner of the brand new Range Rover who just abandoned it at the front, please, come along and move it? He clearly didn't buy on price, he bought on value. So the important thing to think about here is people are happy to spend more to get more value. Here's a great example. Best phone that Nokia ever made, the Nokia 6310i. Back when phones were phones. Back when happy days of mobile phones. The gentleman there smiling clearly had one. Indestructible it was. Best phones going. The other thing, the file effects. People have forgotten how good the file effects is. And let me explain why the file effects is really good. It never runs out of battery. It doesn't need charging. The screen doesn't break if you drop it. Perfect bit of kit. Put these two things together and they can run your entire world. Phone call, yeah, make and receive on the Nokia. Some really basic internet access on there as well. And the file of facts for keeping your diary, all your notes, all your contacts in one place. Absolutely perfect, real low cost solution there. Really price driven solution. Yeah, everybody agree with that? So why do so many people buy them? Smartphones. I don't just mean BlackBerry, I mean HTC or iPhone or whatever you really fancy. People pay extra money to have these sort of devices. They could have the cheap version, the file of facts, the Nokia phone, but they don't, they pay more for that. Now why is that? Some people don't, some people still use the file of facts and that's fine. But the smartphone, that'll give you lots of gubbins and gumph about kind of external case studies that the average smartphone user saves about an hour a day, because that's how it works. If you use a BlackBerry or an iPhone or an HTC, you can save about an hour a day. But yes, it might cost a little bit more, but if it really genuinely got you an hour back a day, how important would that be to you? If somebody said to you right now, I can give you an hour back of your time every single day, would you like it? Yes, please. Absolutely, where do I sign? Press here. Sign here, press hard. It, it, it's true, and people do pay more money for these things. Last version, price versus value. 